please welcome SDL CEO Adolfo Hernandez. Well, well, well. Gosh, I was just talking to Carmen backstage. That's a really tough act to follow, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, good job I didn't see her presentation until now, otherwise I wouldn't have gone to sleep. So I only had to watch it from backstage and think, oh, how do I go right after such a stimulating presentation? I hope you really enjoyed it as much as I did. Hopefully you were more relaxed about it than I was backstage, thinking that I was gonna follow in act. Um, right, so let me see if I can find my foot in now. Um, maybe I should start by saying good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome. Welcome very, very, very much on behalf of all of our colleagues at SDL who work really, really hard to serve you the whole year. And the team that has worked really, really hard for the last few months to put together this event. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here today. Bit of a responsibility to represent them all, but it's just great to see that you're all here. So Betsy mentioned, this is our fourth SDL Connect. I remember uh, the first time when, when I joined the company three and a half years ago and I came over to North America to meet North American customers and find out how we were engaging or not. Or one of the things that came out was like, we really need to put something like this together. Can we, can we try? And, and we did, we did. We put one in just a few months. Uh, that was the one we did in uh, 2016 in Palo Alto. Hands up, please, if you were there. Oh God, that's a minority, right? Good, so we, we did have over 200 people. We used that event to launch the new SDL, the strategy, articulate what our vision was going to be, articulate what kind of problems we were gonna to try to solve, articulate what you could expect from us and also what you couldn't expect from us, what we were gonna to try to do. So I think it was like in England, we call it sort of laying out the stool, right? Fast forward another year, we went all the way down to San Jose. Hands up if you were there, right? Okay, great. So many of you came there, you started to hear about advancements in the global content operating model, how we felt that there many things that needed to really come together. It was about building a logical content supply chain from content creation to content management, integration points, then the translation and ultimately the distribution. And I think we got a lot of interest out of that, that session. We really came out big time on neural, what we, neural, translation, neural machine translation, how we were evolving that. We really started showcasing a number of products. And it was a really interesting event. So we had a lot more people last year. Um, some of you might have joined us in Santa Clara last year. Hands up, please. Okay. So you would remember you know, all the new things that we brought. I think it was a really special event for us. It was the first event we did after combining with the Donnelly Language Solutions team and beefing out our capabilities uh, in the business to work in regulated industries. So that took um, a lot of focus last year. We also started talking around proxy. We started talking about the five future states of content, which it was sort of laying out the vision of the future that we believe it was coming. And, and hopefully what we're doing this year is starting to show the products that we talked about last year, they're real now, but also we're sort of gonna be mapping to the nearly 500 of you here in the room, what you could expect from us. And I'm gonna use the word the next decade. And I know talking in tech about a decade is, is a bit risky, but I really believe the transformation that is taking place in, in this industry is gonna take a decade to really full to really come to fruition and deliver all the value that we can do. So really, really excited. Now, it's only been a year, and gosh, I feel like it was a decade already behind us. We've been really, really busy, right? We, you have kept us really, really busy, and I thank you for that, right? It's been a fascinating year. If you ask our software engineers, they would just say, man, we had to deliver 37 different product releases and versions in a year. That's a lot. We brought out two brand new product categories in one year, the language cloud product and the content assistant that we're gonna talk about. We found some time, by the way, to do some science and get some patterns. You go and talk to our teams in translation and they would say, wow, since the last SDL Connect, they've done with linguists, 
more than 2 billion words translated. And we've been introducing products, solutions, building new relationships, doing the integration with DLS, getting it to, to another area. And then we're also starting to hope that more and more people are noticing that in this space of intelligent content, in this space of intelligent translation, in this world of global understanding, there is a company, a global company, operating in 39 countries, mid-sized company, that is niche, but is focused in trying to deliver the value out of this space. So today, most of us are doing the same thing we were doing the last decade. So we identify a unit, a unit or something, an idea, a concept, a web page, a filing, a medical label, an annual report, and we call that content. And we try to create it, and we try to manage it, and we try to make sure that we do it well. Then we pass it over the fence, and we take that content, and we translate it, and we make it multilingual. That's been the story of this industry. Many companies have been just doing the content, others have just done the translation, I think for over a decade we've been doing both. And you have been telling us that you have a team that does content, and then you have another team that does translation. Some of you have started telling us, actually, we've got the same team now that is working uh, alongside each other. But the real challenge that you're talking to us about is that that model that we've had for a decade doesn't scale. That model is too linear. The 21st century it's not about doing linear things. It's about parallel. It's about augmenting. It's about scale. So if you think about that, in our world of content creation, it's a recipe for failure. So we believe that the next decade needs to introduce four fundamental changes to make it happen. Change number one, we've got to introduce a lot of intelligence in the content. It's not about creating it. Content has to be intelligent. Apply intelligence in the content creation, apply intelligence in the content management, apply intelligence in the content understanding itself, recreating itself, repurposing itself. We've got to inject intelligence in translation. What gets done? How does it get done? Why does it get done? Where does it get done? We've got to move from multilingual to global. Multilingual is probably the world that most of us knew until very recently. Right? You do stuff that comes in English, you do a few European languages, you do Chinese, Japanese, maybe Korean, you're good to go. You can't do that anymore. There are billions of consumers in other continents. There's billions of pages of content, there's interactions, there are opinions that are generated in other languages that are not English. So it's not only multilingual out, it's global in and global out. That requires a radical different way of working. It's also global because you are global companies. You might have content creation here, in Boston, in London, in Mumbai, in Tokyo, but it's you. So you've got to provide a solution that does that. You have translation centers out of India, out of here, Ireland, Paris. You operate on a global theater. So it's not all about technology. It's also about a global operating model that allows you to deliver globally. And then finally, for those of you who are really keen on maths, we've replaced the plus sign right, for a multiplication. Multiplication because it's going to make it all bigger. Because it's going to multiply the value that gets generated in this space. But most importantly, because multiplication means that there's got to be a lot of leverage. Content is going to leverage translation, and translation is going to leverage content. So to solve that, it's a really interesting challenge. And that's the challenge that the 4,500 people at SDL have taken on. That's what we're going to be working on. And I, my plan for the rest of the session is show you not just the slideware 
of where it's going, which is sometimes really interesting. But I want to show you some snippets into some of these technologies into the future so that you see they are real. They're happening, and you're going to see it in a product or in a services offering or an SDL colleague or an SDL partner near you very, very soon. So what we're going to do now is double click on each of them and see that. Let me start with content. And content is something, I'm sorry to go to manage the concept of content in cognitive as per the earlier presentation, that probably requires a little bit of thinking on the flight back to London, but um, content is, that, is that, that unit that captures something that is really valuable. But ultimately, I always used to say, when, when you have done a great digital transformation project, when you've got great connectivity, when you've got great usability, when you've got all of these great things, the one thing that is going to be the make or break for your digital transformation is good content. If you don't have good content, it's not going to work. So we've got a piece of research that proves that 61% of the buying decisions will be driven by good content. So when you've got to go and fix content, you've really got to go and solve a number of problems. So we've decided to focus our energy, our money, our brains, on the problems you've told us you needed help with. Not necessarily in what was sexy, not necessarily in what was trendy, but the stuff that you're telling us is important to you. You told us that you needed help dealing with volume. Because there's a lot of problems associated with volume. How do you create it? How do you create this huge amount of content? How much do you create? Even if you create it, how do you find it? And then if even you could find it, how do you get to process and understand all of that content? You talk to us about quality. You want us to make sure that as you're creating content, you're creating the right content, the content that is really going to get the job done. That's valuable. It's relevant. It's consistent. It has to be the same on Facebook. It has to be the same on Twitter. It has to be on your web page. And it has to be consistent with your filings if you're a public company. And then you've also been telling us that many of you are in regulated industries. You've got to work in format standards. So not only are you going to do all of this, but you've got to do it in very well-defined ways. The third problem is fragmentation, right? We all recognize that we all have different business units. We all have different functions. And everyone has a really good reason why they need to have their own content tab. Does it sound familiar? So as a result of that, it gets fragmented. Of course it does. It's in multiple places. Content has different sponsors. It's created by different people. It's created in different languages, different parts of the world. It's reviewed, edited, approved by different people. It's manual. So of course it's fragmented. So after you've invested a lot of resources and money in creating it, after you figure out a way to kind of find in it, it's very quickly out of date and it is fragmented. And if you have never got the wrong piece of content, I want to know how you do it. Because I give, you know, dying to find the right pieces of content in my daily life, the latest one. So these are the problems you told us you want us to work on, and these are the problems that we're trying to fix. So let me just quickly talk about content. And I, I think we talk about content creation. So we did a survey. Um, study because we wanted to know, yeah, there's a lot of buzz around content, but really how much content? So over the next couple of weeks, you're going to be able to download from our website a white paper, Digital First Globalization Strategy. So what we've done is we've gone and talked to over 300 customers in North America, seniors, trying to understand the content that they need to create, how much do they create? How much do they forecast that they're going to create? How many languages do they translate? How many languages do they think they're going to translate in the future? So we're trying to really put some numbers around the opportunity and the challenge. And obviously, I'm sort of giving you a little bit of uh, some of the first um, numbers out. On average, you guys generate 13,000 content assets a year. 13,000 content assets. That's a lot. 
Now, that means that some of you that are generating millions of assets per month. And you're going to see some examples later. Some of you are generating millions of pages per month, and you even manage to print it. So it's, it's a real big thing. But even if you can do it, then you can find it. You've got to be able to find it. How do you find it? And content, by the way, is not state that stays like that. Because you've got the original idea, that unit of something. And then you've got variations. You've got derivatives. You've got abstracts. Right? So even if you just created one thing, that actually grows up. So really fascinating field to go and research, how do you solve that problem? So we took that, that challenge a few years ago. We've been working on the research. Last year, we started showing um, some of the technological capabilities. And this year, last month, we released the first product. And we are so excited about that very first product, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, that for the time being, it's free. You saw those heat maps on Carmen presentation? Those are the same heat maps I'm looking at now. I'm looking as to what you and your colleagues are doing with that product. We really want to understand how we can, for the short time, not necessarily make money, but figure out how do we make it more useful. That, that product, that content assistant, as I said, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, it's built on our natural language processing platform that we've been working on and researching on now for nearly 15 years. It processes language, it understands language, it models language, it abstracts language, it finds things in the language, it builds a model, and it's able to convert the language. So that platform is something that we continue to work on. We're going to continue extending. We are going to go and do a lot of interesting stuff to find content, but to work with multiple files, to work with taxonomies. We want to get that natural language processing, that intelligence, to be something that you can throw at your content to really be able to understand it, process it, and manage it. So the first product, as I talked about, is the content assistant. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the content assistant for two reasons. Number one, many of you saw it yesterday at the developers' day. Number two, we sort of showcased it here last year. Number three, you've got a theater session this afternoon where you're going to see that, and then tomorrow there's a breakout session on this. But I would truly recommend that you guys go and have a look at it. And just look at it. This is, we've released it first thinking of one use case. That poor marketeer that has to generate a lot of content and a lot of variations. The SDL marketing team was very persuasive. They really needed that tool. So we went to content, market, content management world, marketing world, and we just made it available two weeks ago. It is something that allows you, in a really quick, so allows you to create a summary very quickly of a number of files that you ingest. Then it allows you to get some keywords, allows you to extract quotes, it does entity extraction, it finds numbers. It really just gives you a like quick overview of what that document says. And then you've got a little editor at the bottom where you can start dragging and dropping and doing multiple things. You can convert, create tweets, you can create a number of uh, very good things. You can look suitability of the content for machine translation. So we've, we're sort of showing off a number of capabilities into that very first product. And as I said, if you get a chance to do that, to look at it, you'll like it. But then our engineering team and our science team and our customers were saying, like, can we take this farther? Well, I thought this was cool enough. But let's take it farther. Where would it be cool to take it? Well, can we take it to free form searching? Because processing and letting the machine telling us what it say is interesting. But what about if you could do some interrogation of the content? Free. Right? You've understood the content, Mr. Machine or Mrs. Machine. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Isn't that fascinating? I think the first time we saw something like that was in that sort of 2001 movie that came out. 1968, HAL, I think it was called, that computer. For the record, I wasn't born then. Uh, can't say that very often. Um, so the teams have been doing a little bit of work on that, and I was actually in our lab in, in LA uh, early this week, 
and I was seeing sort of how that, that's matured. So I wanted to show you a snippet of something that you're going to see evolving. So, well, we're not because we're going to play a video, actually. Thank you. So what you're seeing here is in the, in, in the assistant, or oh, soon to be assistant, you've got a document, a document that you've ingested. And you see that on the left-hand side, right? This happens to be an extract of our latest financial filing. The machine has taken it, has understood it, and the machine has decided to suggest that the most interesting questions would be the ones on the right, right? But you might say, well, actually, that's not the question that I have. The question that I want is this one. I want to generate the question, which is what generates annual recurring revenue? And the machine goes there, reads the document, and gives you the answer. Different paradigm. Now, think about what some of these can go and do in terms of, obviously, bringing you back to where the content came in the first place. I mean, many of us spend a lot of time generating FAQs. This thing generates FAQs. Many of us would like to be told what the document says, but we actually have a question. Or well, when you go to a lecture, in a lecture you have a question, you put your hand up. Think about this as a way for you to ask questions as to what's been understood. We're not announcing this, don't ask to buy it. There's nothing to buy, right? It's technology, it's in production, in our labs, and it will be making it into the product going forward. But this is taking it farther. But what about if we could take it even farther? And some of you are telling us, take it even farther. Really help me out to use all of these things to build something like an intelligent content hub. So what is an intelligent content hub? Intelligent content hub is something where if you reference a piece of content which you need on the fly to serve a customer or to print some operating instructions or to create an annual report or to report on a performance of a fund, if you're an asset manager, you don't really need to know what it is. You just call that and intelligently, it founds the source, it connects, it gets it out. You don't have to interrogate tens or thousands of APIs one after the other to find the right content. By the way, the content that it serves you is the right one. So you get that, then the machine processes that content, and it actually teaches the content, and it tells the content, this is what you are. This is what you say. This is your status. We can do that through intelligent tagging. And then it will also say, by the way, you have a kind of like a next door neighbor there because this is a very related form of content that is sitting next to you or somewhere else. Let's just go and work that out. And then once you've got that, then you're able to present it. And you're going to be able to present it to the right person, the right variation, in the right language. I think my team in marketing came out with this thing of cognitive delivery. I think it's a bit of a mouthful. To me, it's like content personalization on steroids, right? We would like to build this because I know a lot of you will be very happy with it. Now, if I stop here, you would say, oh, yeah, of course, motherhood and apple pie. But I'm going to ask a colleague of mine, Joe, to come and join me on stage and show you something very cool. Joe, would you please join us? Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I want to talk to you about some things that we in the Tridian team have been working on uh, to make content not really only organize itself, but really to relate itself to ideas and objects in the real world. So this is really all about what Adolfo has just said, these piles and piles of content that we are creating. And these cause big challenges for us. So it's not only about findability, it's also about creating redundant content. So we've got different teams of people in the same organization creating essentially different versions of the same thing. And that's not good. You can get inaccuracies coming in there. It can be uh, inconsistent and so on. So this is, and of course, it's a big waste of effort. This is one of the things. Also, uh, when you don't automate workflows, when you're relying on manual workflows all the time, again, you can have these inconsistencies, in inaccuracies creeping in, and so on. 
And this is a really big deal when we're talking about regulated industries um, because the risk of this in inaccurate content really gets quite big. From an end user point of view, of course, uh, the problems are even bigger. First of all, it's really difficult to find the content that you want to find. Secondly, even when you find it and you've got onto it, sometimes it feels just like a dead end. It's like it gives you a little bit of your answer, but it doesn't give you the links to the other things that you need to find out to really piece together a whole decision that you're trying to make. So wouldn't it be nice if the machines kind of thought in the way that we did to make these connections? Right now, things are disconnected. Wouldn't it be nice if the machines could make those connections to say, I understand what this content is about, and what teams it relates to, and what other bits of content are depend on, dependent on it, and so on. And actually we can, and in the new, near future. So this is knowledge graph technology. And it's very much actually similar to those kind of cog cognitive networks that Carmen was explaining about earlier. And it's just a technical way of kind of modeling the same kind of stuff. And it's not kind of rocket science, it's not way out there. This is perfectly doable, and this is stuff that we're working on right now. And the, you have to give the machines a little bit of help. And the way that you do this is through taxonomy. So taxonomy. Taxonomy is basically about organizing information. And let's dip straight into an example. So you've got an organization that is producing information about financial regulations and products. And as a big kind of regulated organization itself, it needs to use a standard industry taxonomy, which in this case is Eurovoc. So a very big uh, public taxonomy in the European Union. So they have to use this to not only organize their own content, but in order to reliably exchange it with other organizations. So the key task here is how do you tag these bits of content with the things from Eurovoc that apply to it? And one approach, of course, is to completely automate all of that. To say, let's publish it all, get it out there, and then let's try and kind of figure out what it was supposed to be about after the fact. And some people do that, and there are cases when it kind of works, but it's problematic, particularly for regulated industries, because you are making all these kind of inferences, and some of them might actually be wrong, so you can get inaccuracies in there. So it's much better if we do what's a very familiar, so Tridian Docs users here, we know how to do this, right? We know that the best way to get quality content is to bake in that intelligence in the start as an author. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. You don't need very complicated tools, and we'll be talking about this later. But you certainly need to kind of get in that key intelligence to the content from the start. And it's just the same thing with taxonomy. We should be able to do this. But clearly, as you've just seen, I mean, these taxonomies can be massive things. And so if you're asking your authors, so increasingly subject matter experts, they don't really care about all this stuff. You know, it's a big task to drill through this thing and pick exactly the tag that they need. So how can we make it easier for them? And we absolutely can. So I want to show you a design preview of some stuff that we're working on to really solve this problem for authors. So as you see here, I'm entering in some content. Uh, in this case, it's about a newish kind of European financial regulation. And instantly, as I'm entering content, I'm getting suggested matches from my Eurovoc taxonomy. This isn't just picking kind of random keywords. These are matches against the taxonomy itself. So exactly the kind of thing that I need to pick here uh, to reliably tag this content. And what are the kind of matches I'm getting? Well, you get some very obvious ones, like financial instrument. It's in the text. It's not rocket science. You get some other interesting ones, like productivity. Productivity isn't actually in there, but you've got a very close synonym, efficiency. And again, through the power of the taxonomy there, we're able to recognize it's the same thing, so you should probably tag it with productivity. Stepping it up a little bit more, we've got this tag called credit policy. Credit policy is not in the text. Nothing really equating to credit policy is in the text. And yet, if you get the sense of that whole text, it's very much related to credit policy. And somebody, an end user looking at this content and wanting to see related content, is probably going to want to see some content about credit policy. So how do we get this? Again, it's not kind of smoke and mirrors. It's not rocket science. It's exactly through those same connections in the taxonomy, through that knowledge graph. You're making these semantic links, and you are getting to this. Why is this so important to do it in this way? Well, because it's explainable. 
you can trace all the steps that led to this tagging decision being made. This is really, really important. In a time when people are worried about the algorithms making all their decisions for them, and in a time when the regulations are getting stricter and stricter, it's really important to be able to explain how did you get to this end, basically. And we can do this in this way. Now, of course, you will get some false positives. We get designs and models. We get fruit products. Don't know where that came from. This is typical. You know, whether you do it fully automated or you involve an author, you're going to get some false matches like this. But here it's very easy. I just deselect them, and then I have very high quality tagging going forward. So I've made that whole big task of that big taxonomy tree picking tags, I've made it much, much easier here. So what's the impact on end users? So as ma many of you probably know, taxonomy is the thing that drives, for example, faceted search. So you search for a term, and you're able to drill down and really find exactly the kind of thing you want by filtering down on these tags that we've just used. Similarly, um, synonym search. So you can allow users to use the language that's familiar to them, exactly the keywords that they're used to. Um, and through the power of the taxonomy, again, they're able to find things that are relevant to them. We're able to far better drive things like chatbots here. Often the challenge with chatbots is they just can't match your intent, what you're looking for, um, with the content that's actually relevant here. So with the taxonomy, that becomes much, much more easy. And there's one more thing. Back on the left bit, where you've got that little block of text about financial instruments, that's not coming from any of the documents here. That's coming directly from this knowledge graph, this kind of web of connected ideas and information. This is really important. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the Google knowledge graph. Most people know it through, like, for example, if you're typing in the name of a person you want to find out about, and you get that box of kind of biographical information up on the right. And it's the same kind of thing there. Just as with the Google knowledge graph, you show this little piece of text um, from the knowledge graph. This is what we have here. And this is all indicating that this is just the, well, to use that cliche, it is the tip of the iceberg. It is just the visible aspect of that big kind of web of connections. And this ultimately is what's going to help us solve the other problems too. Those problems of creating redundant content, of inaccuracy, of wasted effort, of poor user experience. So we're able to do all of this uh, in a very easy and explainable way using this technology. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Adam. Fantastic. Joe, after standing here for five minutes, now you understand why I had to get off, right? It's just so bright and so hot. So if I faint, uh, please do excuse me. Right, so we talked about dealing with intelligence, content, creation, the volume challenge, right? And I, th I think we hopefully we've given you a good, a good sneak preview of what we're doing and what's coming and why we're doing it, because... Hopefully that resonates with you, because most of you have told us you've got those problems. Some of you might say, actually, that's quite handy. Now I'd like to start engaging. There will be sessions. Look out for Joe and the team on that, and, and we'll be able to do a lot more. Mm -hmm.